Professor Wright, thank you for joining us in Heidelberg and actually presenting at our conference. You are the doyen of child psychiatry in the UK and have even a whole institute named after you, Institute of Child Psychiatry. So obviously my first question is, I mean, what is different about child psychiatry compared to normal psychiatry or why do we need child psychiatry? Well, we need it because of the importance of development mm. and that it's not that development isn't important throughout the whole of psychiatry, it is. Mm. And one of the big changes, I think, is a recognition that many of the mental disorders that we used to think of as only occurring in adult life, like mm. schizophrenia, we now know have their origins uh, much earlier. Mm. But the studying and understanding of development, that is the thing that is most distinctive about mm. child psychiatry. So one of the comments you made that with psychiatric experience, it's like with the immune system. You have to have them as a child in order to be able to learn how to cope with them with negative events in your whole life. Point. So that you're right, that one of the things that is crucial um, to understand is that challenge and stress is a normal part of life. And in the same way that you don't have good physical health by avoiding all contact with germs, mm -hmm. you develop good health by being exposed and coping. So the same thing applies in the psychiatric arena that one needs to help children to cope with the challenges they face uh, but not to prevent them as it were meeting challenges because mm -hmm. that's part of growing up. With even the worst experiences uh, some children do okay and therefore if we can understand better why it is that some children come through that, uh, maybe even strengthened by the experience, whereas others succumb, that provides a way of moving forward in uh, thinking about a therapeutic intervention. There's no doubt that abuse is a serious risk factor. That's not in dispute. But even with abuse, uh, it's not inevitable, and we must learn, as it were, through our research findings, how to translate that it's not inevitable into this is something we can do to help. Mm. So rather look at the positive. Example. Yes. And another saying it is it takes a whole village to raise a child. Yes. And so one, and actually one of the major works showed that they need, they have attachment, but not necessarily to one person, in most cases the mother, but to a whole range of persons. One needs to have multiple opportunities of relationships, so it is, it is a good thing, as it is with everything. You don't want to put everything all on one thing. Mothers can die, the family can break up, so you need to be able to develop attachment relationships with multiple people and make it work. Well, I think it's important to see that children are part of families, families are part of community, and for a child, of course, part of the community is very much the school. So that the study that we did years ago of effective schooling, we talked in the book, uh, the title was 15,000 hours. That's the number of hours that we reckon, on average, the child spends in school. Now, it's not that the child as a rule develops attachment relationships with teachers, but the relationships with teachers in a broader way are very important. They provide a model, uh, they're important in helping the child, not just in learning the three R's, reading, writing and arithmetic, uh, but in learning socially, uh, learning how to cope. Um, so schools are very important and the broader community is too. And there is research now that shows that it's the supportive aspects of the community which are really important and that when we talk about communities that are disorganized, it's not that they are positively toxic in their effects, but that they do not provide the kind of support that is what you need from the community. Mm -hmm. A lot of research into diseases in general, not just psychiatry or mental diseases, on the one hand, on one side, you have the epidemiology. On the other hand, you have the biology or the molecular biology. That one is looking at the prevalence and the environmental, social, whatever causes. Others side is trying to untangle the molecular causes. 
Um, and you think that epigenetics, which has become a very hot topic in the last year, could be the bridging link between the epidemiology and the molecular biology, particularly in psychiatry? Well, epigenetics is, is part of what has been proposed for the way in which experiences, as it were, get embedded, get part of the biology. It's a bit early to know whether that will provide the answer that the people involved with epigenetics hope that it will, but it's certainly it's a major contender. Um, and I think the notion of separating off biology from psychosocial experiences and development is gone. I mean, it makes no sense. It is part of a unified whole with different aspects being emphasized according to what people's expertise is mainly involved with. But the idea of disorders due to nature and disorders due to nurture, that's dead. Scientists, geneticists, say, with good evidence, that genetic influences are very important. Now they say, but the identified genes that we know about all have a terribly small effect. How does that all come together? And that is a bit of a mystery still, and people put forward different views. So I think the understanding of how genetic influences work and the fact that they are probabilistic, that's to say, they don't determine that you will get schizophrenia or autism or whatever it may be, but they play a part along with other experiences in making it more or less likely um, that you will develop this condition. Now I say more or less likely because people tend to think about genes in terms of genes that carry bad risks, but of course we know from research in the field of cancer that the genes that protect are as important as the genes that put at risk. The same will probably apply in the field of mental disorders. And how do you see this as a new therapeutic option for developing drugs that could try to <coughs> work on this level of regulation? I'm a bit skeptical. Um, it's not that uh, there aren't drugs that can affect uh, methylation, which is one of the processes, one of the chemical processes involved in epigenetics, but uh, it would be a drug that would have to have an influence in some tissues and not in others, uh, for some kinds of uh, genes and not others. Could that occur? Well, yes, I suppose so, but it's quite a long way down the line. So I think it's important in getting us to think about the possibility. I don't think it's anywhere near uh, a point where it's actually usable. Okay, Professor Rata, thank you very much for the interview. <coughs> I've enjoyed talking with you. Okay.